All right. We're here. It's hey, Jack and Rainwater. Yep. And tonight, sir, we are discussing the wonderful, nerve-wracking, want-to-throw-yourself-off-the-window moments before it happens, <laughs> critique. Uh, critiques. Feedback. Critiques. Commentary. When reviews. You put, it's really when you put yourself out there. Yeah. Um, right. It's kind of like walking around naked. If uh, if you've done it right, and in terms yeah. of towards your art, if you don't give a shit about critique, you're either a egomaniacal asshole, know it all with no sense of humility, or you played it safe and yes. you did what other people thought want wanted, and then you're probably still gonna be up the river. For uh, sure. But I wanted to talk about critique because I don't think. A lot of people understand it, and I don't think we, you and I, we were just before we started recording, we were talking about. I don't think a lot of people know how to do it or how to handle it. Oh yeah, um, definitely don't there's... know how to handle it. If the internet <laughs> tells us anything about how people feel about critiques, uh, this is actually what I've been thinking about a lot in regards to this episode. Is that for me, I, and I don't know about how you feel about this, but like you know, going to Savannah College of Art and Design. Um, you would do projects and at the end of the projects this is probably one to two week to do a project and at the end of that one to two weeks you had the critique day mm -hmm. and yes critique for me i don't know if it was for you but critique day was an anxiety inducing day mm -hmm. because you spent all this time working on like okay this is my magnum opus for this week how are what are people going to think about it are they going to understand what I did? How is it going to land? Uh, what, just, just in terms of what I was just saying, Jal, do you have any ways that you would describe what you felt like on critique day? Um, I'm trying to tap into that memory. Yeah. Well, because... let me go deeper into my memory for a little bit then. Um, yeah. So critique day was like, okay, I got up. Like the moment I got up, Right, because like, I spent the night before, <laughs> like probably working to two or three in the morning, and I'm like, I've done everything I can. It's in God's hands now. <laughs> and, and go to sleep, wake up, and the first thing that's on my mind is, what are they going to think about these two pages that I've put together over the course of this week? The main thing that was always on my mind is. What's most important to me is will they be able, will I communicate what I'm trying to communicate, right? Mm -hmm. Like, will they be able to read it and understand it? That's the most important part. That was the thing that, like, in sequential art and all the classes, that was the thing that we were all taught was, like, the pinnacle, or not the pinnacle, but the most important part of you being competent as an artist, mm -hmm. as an illustrator, as a storyteller, Will your ideas be able to transmit from your brain onto the paper so it can be transmitted into another person's brain? If you can succeed at that, everything else will be easier. If you can't succeed at that, you have no chance. And so that was always the first thing on my mind is, all right, will I be like, will this will this succeed in doing that? And everything after that is like icing on the cake, right? So there were critiques where there were times where I didn't communicate properly what I was trying to communicate. And that always felt like the worst feeling. Uh, and that kind of goes back to what is sort of essential to art, right? Is um, an artist is trying to get out of their isolation and share their ideas with another person. If they can't, if they can't accomplish that, their, their isolation increases because now they just feel more and more like they're, what they're thinking or what they're saying is so unutterable or so difficult to understand that it can't be it can't be gotten across basically it's unrelatable yes and and that absolutely is probably one of the biggest fears you brought up a nice point um if they taught you guys in illustration and comics and all that kind of stuff about having a point to what you yep. were trying to communicate then they did a hell of a lot better in those departments at SCAD than they did in the film department. Because I think one of the biggest problems of the film department was 
nobody knew what the fuck they were trying to say. Um, and a lot of it was backed up with, I don't want to say it was style, but it was style. Yeah. They were trying to justify what they were trying to do through the style. Does that make sense? Like they were like, yeah. you would point out something and they would be like, no, but that's real life. And it's like, I don't care that it's real life. I don't, <laughs> I don't need to see your character wake up in the morning. Like it's, it's yeah. been done to death. It tells me nothing. And I don't think a lot of filmmakers knew what they were trying to say. That's hilarious because that was like, um, like, are you talking about scenes where somebody wakes up and punches the alarm clock kind of a thing? That's every student every... film ever, <laughs> ever. That was ever. like one of the first things um, our, I think it was our writing teacher, Mark Neese was like, don't do not open a story. <laughs> <laughs> with the alarm clock and somebody turns it off. I don't want to see it. Don't yep. do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, and that's how it was. And ever and I can tell you, I remember even well into junior year, film uh film students were still doing it. And defiantly, nonetheless, they would you know what I mean? It was always here's my character waking up in the morning, the start of their day is the start of the story. And not only did it say nothing, but Everybody did it. So it was just like, oh, everybody's making the same noise. Wow. Oh, and, and uh, I must I must admit, scene number two was always my job sucks. I'm in a cubicle. Yeah. And that was always, you know, number two. And then number three was my car doesn't start. It basically became the bitch fest of every poor i don't want to say poor but you know when you're a, a college student nine times out of ten who poor. was trying to get into the arts and they don't they want to get out of their yeah their work a day yeah. job that's not right great. and yeah it was always it was always i'm stuck in a cubicle with my white uh collared shirt and my tie and i'm making telemarketer calls or whatever it may be but it was always wake up in the morning i hate my alarm clock i hate going to my job my car sucks this girl won't talk to me. That, like it was always that sequence of, and every character was that. And it was just like, Oh, another one. So for me, I never, I, I honest to God, I never did that. And I, I wear that as a badge of honor that yeah. I can't call. Now I'm, I'm sure when one of our fellow uh, scatties comes on as a guest, one of them might be able to call me out and be like, no, you did that project with this. And that. I'll be like, God damn it. I forgot about that. Like PTSD, I blocked it out. But I don't think I did do that. Um, so for me, critique really was about, do I fit in here? Because at art college, as a film student, I felt like an outcast to begin with. Like it wasn't a film school. There was a film department, a film right. wing. There was that section. But everybody else was, you know... Um, Drawing, painting, fabricating, it was all color, colors, patterns, pens, so, markers, paintbrushes, etc. Whereas so you're saying us, in the class there were a lot of people who were also doing other majors at the same right. time? So okay. there yeah, so it was like 2D design and stuff like that. Like yeah. I can draw. I am decent at drawing, in my opinion. I'm yeah. not great at it. I enjoy no, doing seen, it. I but, mean, I've seen the stuff that you've painted on your walls. Like I'd say that's definitely decent. You know, Absolutely. like that's, yeah, I, that's getting the job I, done. I got out of college uh, with a little bit of art, artness yeah. rubbed off on me. But then again, but as a film major, I was there. And so it was always, always, always uh, a burden to me to wake up on those days because I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't know if I was doing it right. I didn't know how to art. If that, yeah, and yeah so and nobody I, does if they're in art school, right? That's why you're in art school because yeah. you don't know how to art. But even then, when I was there, I just felt like, I don't know if I'm grasping this right. Like the lesson, I don't understand if I did it right. It's like stumbling around in the dark. So going there, I'm putting myself at the mercy of people who, everyone else in the class, like if I didn't know their major specifically, I felt like they were pros. Like they had been doing this forever and they knew what they were talking about and they were just going to say I sucked. And so it was dreadful for me. And so I got yes. to so film, then, I, then it was just, you know, I, they couldn't shut me up. That's a great thing to bring up because that was the other part for me, which was nerve wracking was I knew that I was putting my work up in front of other people who I respected as artists mm -hmm. and thought of as better being better than me. And so yeah. I would have this feeling of like, well, what's even the point? You know, like, of course, yeah. they're going to say, well, you know, it's just not that great. 
because you can see how obviously better my stuff is. <laughs> but um, I think over time, I mean, it was hard. It was hard in art school, right? Because I don't think I learned, I don't think I really learned how to draw until years later after art school. And, Same thing uh, with film. 100%. Like it really, yeah. it really required me just starting to draw books till I got to a point where I started to, things started to click after I took all the stuff I learned in art school and applied it in a um, more definitive way. But I will say the one thing I did learn in art school was how to critique properly. And it, and it was something that came after practicing it for years, right? Because, I mean, the first classes is like people are like, well, I mean, you did the thing, so... <laughs> or it looks good, you know? I don't know what else to say. Because, at you know, when you're starting, like... Um, well, okay, so great anecdote. Um, our 3D design class, right? You and me, oh, yes. Matt. Um, you know, we didn't really get a lot out of those critique days because most, uh, including us, like most everybody just didn't really know what to say other than it looks good. Uh, I think you've accomplished the objective. And then, you know, our teacher would come in and kind of like say some things. And one thing you would always like to say is dynamic. <laughs> and... There's always we, those words that oh no one knows what the fuck they really yeah. mean, but if you use them in critique, you sound like yeah. you know if what you're liked, talking about. <laughs> if he liked the design, he would say it was dynamic. And mm. I think at the time, I had no idea what the hell dynamic <laughs> was supposed to mean as a word. Like yeah. I understand it intuitively now, but at the time, I was like, what does that even mean? Like You're just saying it's nice like to me. Yep. And um, so... You know, at the beginning, critique seemed very not not unnecessary, but it just seemed like um, I just I was like, why are we doing this? But mm. over time, over the years, as I did more and more critiques, it became more and more aware to myself. Oh, we're all doing this so that we a we can learn to understand what our own aesthetic is, to understand what another person's aesthetic is, and then how to communicate from my aesthetic, this is what I like and what I don't like about your aesthetic. And this is what I am understanding of your aesthetic that I think if you changed these things would make it better in the trajectory that you're trying to go. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Like, yeah. basically seeing where an artist's trajectory is trying to go, attempting to go, and saying what you can, what they can do to improve it. And then also saying what you appreciate about their aesthetic as well. Sure. Like, are there aesthetic choices? And also through critique, you are just by the act of seeing another person's work, you learn things that you can apply to your own art. And sure. so that it's my favorite things about critique are that it's a growing process for both individuals simultaneously. And that's, that's why I kind of feel sad about like the, the nature of critique right now on the internet, because it is very like, it's very oriented in one direction. And that direction is just like the path of the sword, just cutting everything down and, um, but also, also no, on the flip side, like it, everybody cuts everything down, but on the flip side, when that critique that comes through that I do believe is valid. No, granted that's an, uh, that's kind of a loaded word here because critique in itself is an opinion. But when a valid critique does come through, it's all sword or not sword, uh, shield. There's yeah. 100% on the yeah, on yeah. the part of the artist in the internet where it's just like, well, you don't know anything, and how many awards do you have, and how many <laughs> how many followers are on your Twitter? You know, like it's like one yeah. of those things. So it's like the road goes both ways. So yeah, no, that's a really good point because I feel like what I also learned through practicing critique is like, Oh, I can just have my own fucking opinion and it doesn't <laughs> matter what somebody else thinks. That's right. their opinion. Yeah. And you can back it up with all the degrees, pedigrees, whatever. It doesn't matter because your perspective is still your perspective yes. and their perspective is still just their perspective. Mm. Uh, and I, I just remember for me, and I want to ask you this question too. Yeah. The first time that I received a critique that I felt was great 
and it was in my 2D design, which is when I finally felt accepted as an artist. Um, I forget what the particular assignment was, but I remember what the piece was that I made. And it was, lo and behold, this was very amateur of me, but it was uh, the sink in my dorm room with a tube of toothpaste and my toothbrush and like a comb sitting on it. And that was it. That's all that I draw drew. Yeah. But the entire color scheme I drew it under was uh, shades of blue. And for some reason, it was the first time that I had done a project and I just said, you know what? That's how I see this. That's how I want to see this. I see this in my head yeah. as blue. And I just want to do this thing blue. And for some reason, because I applied what I wanted to, what I artistically was aiming for, the critique went better than any critique I can remember ever getting. Oh, and nice. it was such a mundane picture. It was yeah. toothpaste and, a, and a, a dorm room sink. And for some reason, it went over famously. Everybody's like, oh, wow, the, the way the shadow falls and this and that. And I'm like, really? Like, okay. But I just remember that was the moment that I felt like, okay, maybe taking the chance and just going after what's in here, what's in my yeah. brain, maybe that's how I need to art from now on. Whenever I art, I need to just chase my brain and oh, that's yeah. going to start putting me in a place where it's not pedestrian art or anything like that. It's just something yeah. it feels valid like it like I like I was meant to be there. I was curious to know, did you have a moment like that that sticks out to you where you finally got a critique and you were like, "Wow, I I did it. I'm really good here." <laughs> <laughs> um I, yeah, you know, actually that time that, and this is actually how I ended up getting into cartooning was, um, so I took Ray Goto's cartooning class at SCAD and we, at the time I did it because I wanted, I just wanted to figure out what it was like to do stuff for animation, storyboarding, character design, stuff like that. And as I learned sort of the, the principles of how, um, making uh making characters for film or tv animation or making storyboards how like it worked and as mm -hmm. things started to click i understood like i began to understand like oh this really fits with me and then i start that was the first class in in the sequential arts program where i started getting like really positive feedback about my character designs uh, i started to feel like i was getting feedback that i understood what i was doing because the previous like, I mean, before that, the previous class was, it was very much superhero comics, which is a very, you know, realistic or naturalistic style, yeah. right? Um, you have to have a very keen understanding of human anatomy in a way that you can't fake it at all. And cartooning is like the whole other, a whole other route where you can fake it all you want. Faking it is, or I say you can fake it. What I mean is you can, you can abstract it. Yes, yeah. you can abstract it in so many way, in so many different and clever ways that you need to have a basic understanding of anatomy and you're still communicating a basic understanding of anatomy, but it's about communicating the character, right? Like it's about communicating energy, basically. Mm. Yeah. Uh, not to get too woo, but like uh, to, to basically you want to communicate the, the energy that's taking place rather than the form. And so... That worked better for me. And as I got more positive critiques on my character design. So like, uh, I think one of the first ones where I felt like I was hitting it was I did um, like a maquette, like a sculpture um, that was supposed to be a 3D turnaround for an animation character. And it was a character, this character named Priscilla, like I've always had this sort of in the back burner idea for this. A uh, story called Pigeon and Priscilla, and Priscilla is just like a like a nine or ten year old girl who's got like an aviator cap and uh, goggles and like an aviator's jacket and shorts and like cargo shorts. And that was the first project I did where I was just like I felt like I was a hundred percent in it, like I was just really involved in it. And yeah. it was the first thing that I made where I was like, this feels like a this feels like a completed thing, you know, and looking back on it now, it's like, it's okay. <laughs> like, it's okay. Yeah. But it made an impression on the class and everybody who looked at it really felt like I had done, like I had pulled off the idea of translating my 2D sketch, right? 
and then making a 3D version of it. Because that was the whole idea is you have a 3D turnaround so that yeah. you could be able to draw this character from any angle if you're like animating, if you're animating the character. So yeah, I'd say that was my first, that's the first example that I can think of that I can remember, you know, and then beyond that, you that was probably actually the first good one that I can remember for a while, actually. Like I didn't I didn't get any really I didn't get critiques where I felt like I was doing great until senior year. Mm -hmm. Uh but in, so in that middle point, like it was always like learning critiques, like, oh, here's what you could do better, you know. Which are good. They're valuable, Absolutely. but they're not great for self esteem. <laughs> like no. They're not great for feeling yelling it or anything. So All right. So next question. What was there ever a moment, especially at SCAT, because I have a, a small story to, uh, to throw out here for this, where you felt you nailed giving a critique like you really felt like you communicated with the artist and they were receptive and maybe the rest of the class was in agreement to it? Because I know for me, I want to say it was documentary class, but I don't. But it, the teacher definitely wasn't. So it might have been senior project. But there was, and not to get into politics here, but there was um, one of the other students was doing a documentary for his yeah. uh, senior project. And the, I think it was about the environment and the sustainability, but the entirety of the documentary was kind of pointed towards um, George W. Bush and the Republican um administration and how they were destroying the environment and this and that now at the time i was kind of a conservative and I, I, when i say i was kind of a conservative i mean that in the sense that i was more so contrarian um and that's not an attribute but at the time i was always the guy who everybody looks this way and i was like well why aren't we looking that way and so when when he did that class, everybody in the class, and especially in like the film department, it's very liberal. They were all like applauding it. I have to say, in retrospect, the graphics and voiceover were astoundingly well done. It was very professionally done. But yeah. I remember saying I was like probably one of the few people in the class that had that opposite mindset um, of this is great, this is perfect, yada yada yada. I remember I said to him because in senior project they had you, everybody had to participate in critique. So it went down the line and everybody just kind of was patting him on the back down the line. And when it got to <laughs> me, I I actually didn't give a critique. I just asked one simple question and the teacher lit on to it. And she was like, exactly. Andrew is the one who's got the great critique and da, 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 da. And everybody in the class, I don't know how they felt about it, but I didn't feel hated. The question was, and I asked this directly to the filmmaker, are you preaching to the choir or are you trying to convert the sinners in the sense yeah. of and, and I, I outed myself there. I said, I'm, you know, I'm a conservative and, you know, this really doesn't feel valid to me. It feels like, you know, it's very um, like there's it felt felt like there was things left out, like it wasn't the whole story. So I was trying to ask him if his goal was. Was it was your goal to rally the troops of the environmentalists or was it to convert the people who see things differently? Because I didn't feel like it was converting me. And the, the teacher was thrilled. She was like, that's exactly the kind of question that you need to be asking when you're yeah. making something like this. And I think she agreed with me. And I don't think she's a conservative or anything like that. She was a very liberal professor. But in that moment, the point of the story is. And I, I'm not really a conservative now. Just let me put that out there. I'm more of an independent. We'll, we'll get into that in some future po uh, podcast <laughs> about art and politics. But I don't feel like having us uh, canceled just yeah. yet. But I'm more of an independent these days. Either way, the point being, that was the first time I gave a critique. And I really felt like I had contributed something to that filmmaker's arsenal. Whether or not he listened to it, re-edited, yada, yada, yada. I felt like I had made a valid thing for him to consider about his yeah. project and maybe either approach it differently or approach the next project he made differently or whatnot. But that's when I really started feeling like I could volunteer help in a way that was not pretentious. Like it didn't feel like I was shitting on him or yeah. acting like I was better, but I was legitimately part of the team. You know what I mean? Like everybody yeah. needs to have that person going against you on your team so that 
they can be the you know the team is ready for what's coming at them. That's, yeah, that's I made I, I I built a lot of class like I, I I made a lot of classmate friendships because I would give you know like competent critiques in a way that they felt like I was helping mm-hmm. them figure out what they're trying to do. You know, yes. like I mean it was really basic stuff like. Oh, you know, if you change the composition on this one panel in such a way, you could actually communicate your point better, you know? And then after giving my little my little critique, like, uh, or after a little bit after a while, like, there's sort of a recognition and gleam in, in each other's eyes where it's like, oh, I get you and I get you, you know? And so that becomes a relationship that builds off of it where it's like, they start giving me good critiques that I really appreciate it because they started getting what I was trying to do. And that's that's one of my favorite feelings. That was one of my favorite feelings about those classes was that camaraderie that builds up after a while when when artists start to understand each other. And you know, you would see I would see it where it was like I could tell like who in the class was really um really glomping on to each other in terms of aesthetics and whatever because they would always give like the best critiques for for each other in terms of mm-hmm. what they're picking up you know and what they have to offer and i mean that's kind of the uh, that's another aspect of critique is that your a critique is only as good as you know how each other understands each other's work right mm-hmm. like if you're not understood by the person which is something that is hard on you, but it is also part on the other person too. That's the other weird part about it, right? It's like, Mm -hmm. there's a, there's a good deal of it that is based on the recipient of the art just as much as the person who's making the art. And it's almost um, like artistic sex. Like there's a rhythm to it. And when you find someone you you quote unquote fuck with, then like, you know what I mean? Like you you get it. Like it it feels good for both of you. And, you know, something, you know, it's just like a positive thing where you both walk away and like, I want to critique with that guy again. Like, it's yeah, just like, <laughs> exactly. But that, it's great because if you have, if you find a really good complimentary, like uh, a good complimentary person that way, you really make each other better as artists really fast. And it's awesome. Like, that's yeah. one, of, I, it's a feeling that I miss a lot because I, it's not something that I've come across since scad and well i mean i shouldn't say that i have come across it in the past um in portland i met a lot of artists who really helped me like um really helped me get my game up a lot and i'm very thankful for them um but point being finding those relationships are really crucial to uh, a career in arts to just just communicating in general, because even let's, I mean, not even just in arts, just in terms of having somebody who helps keep you honest and mm-hmm. is not cruel about it. They just get you and understand you, right? Like, yes. you, you those kind of relationships are defined. You lit onto something very important there is that there are some sadomasochists when it comes to critique. And some of these people come in with a loaded gun. Um, whether they don't like you personally, whether they know something about your religion, your politics, your whatever, they are looking to take a shot at you. Um, right. And I was going to ask you about that because that's another thing that's a very important critique is how you interpret and apply other people's critiques. So like for me, yeah. um, I have a screenwriters group that I go to every Monday, or at least I did before COVID, and hopefully – uh, when COVID's over, we'll be doing it again. But anyway, the point being, I have a rule, general rule of thumb. Nine times out of ten, I'm not listening to the suggestions on the part of other artists. I'm not saying it's, uh, it's, a, it's a certainty that I'm always ignoring what they're telling yeah. me I should do. Uh, occasionally, I will find – it's like you said. I'll find one or two people in the group who get what I'm trying to do, who get my style – And we'll suggest something and I'll think, yes, that's what I need to do. But nine times out of ten, what I do, I hear the critique and I listen to where the problem is. And then I forget everything else that they're telling me. And I lie down to that problem and I'm like, okay, I'm not executing this correctly. And I need to figure out how to do it differently 
in my way to yeah. communicate that thought better. And it does come back to the original thing was if you don't have something you're trying to execute, a point you're trying to get across, a theme, whatever it may be, then you're kind of spinning around in the chair and it's like you're not doing anything. So all critique won't matter. But if you have a point that you're trying to get, illustrate, when someone tells you, I'm not getting that, like, oh, this was supposed to be, oh, he was supposed to be intimidating her in this scene. Oh, I didn't get that at all. I thought he was flirting with her. And then you have to take a step back. And I'm like, oh, I did that wrong. She interpreted that wrong. Now, it's possible that the person really wasn't paying attention, that they were secretly on their phone under the table, or they just don't get what's going on in general. Like you have to, you have to objectively, and I hate this, but you have to judge your critique person um, a little oh, sure. bit to kind of gauge where they are as an artist and what yeah. their motives are and decide what takeaways to take from their critique. I'll give you a only... weird analogy on yeah. that idea too. Um, so there is, there's a style of tarot reading called the Celtic cross and in the Celtic cross, the um, there are three cards where their purposes are. You have two cards that give you um two polarities in your question so like you might have a question of like uh and i say this as something i've kind of done uh how will what will how well will dogecoin do in 2021 all right let's say that that's the question uh so your first two cards that you will draw will be part of that what are the two polarities in the question so like what are two attributes in the question um so it might be like, okay, you're asking this question because you want to get rich fast, and um, you also have, you know, like resource insecurities. And then there's a third card that you draw later on, and this third card is considered the questioner's viewpoint. So it's basically like, where are you right now internally, mentally, when you're asking this question? Like, what are you thinking? What are you um what what uh what's influencing you from outside mm. of yourself things like that so i'm saying this as when you're hearing somebody give you a critique it's re it is really important to consider what are all the particulars that are influencing influencing them right now because there are certain critiques where it's like okay well this is you know, you're, you might be repeating stuff that you've heard from a book you've read or just like, you know, like a cultural meme or some sure. kind of fixation. Yeah, uh, that happens, you know, like that happens where you get feedback where, and and that kind of feedback, unfortunately, can be not very useful. Uh, sometimes it's useful, but not generally it's not very useful because it doesn't actually help you figure out what it is that you're aiming for because most artists are not aiming for what the general culture is going for. They're trying to go for what is coming from within their heart, their soul, yeah. whatever. Yep. Um, so I, I, I think I kind of interrupted though, what were you, you were saying, Joe, did you have somewhere that you were going with that beyond my, my weird tarot analogy? What was I, what was I talking about? You got to remind me. Uh, now. Well, because you were talking, cause the whole thing was about how you have to be careful about, Oh. The perspective of like, you know, the person who's critiquing you, where they're coming from. Yeah, there's some people and I, you really. So, OK, I'm a screenwriter. Yes, I, I've won awards. Yes, I've been produced. Yes, I've done this. I've done like a whole slew of, of credentials that validate my writing and me as a writer. Does that make me better than someone who's never written a script? Yes and no. Yeah. So, you know what I'm saying? Like, there are people in my group who have never written a script and yeah. have given me contributions that I've never even thought of. And it was just like, wow, that person just has raw, natural talent. And then there's oh, other yeah. people who have outdone me in terms of validation and what they've done in that field. And I think everything that they've told me is shit. And <laughs> it's one of those things... Where not only am I thinking, is this guy just trying to sabotage me? Or does he is he just so out of touch now with yeah. where everything was? Or is he so egotistical oh, that's a, yeah, that he's trying to I put me down? Like, yeah. it's just one of those things where you really have to 
approach You never critique. know where good insight's going to come from. You really yeah. have no idea where good insight's going to come from at all. But I one mean, of the big, the big takeaway for me was always, I don't want to lose my voice through the critique. Because, like, we, we talked about the internet. You look at it, you put out a movie now, it doesn't matter what movie it is, uh, a giant section of Twitter fucking hates it. And then there's another section of Twitter that vehemently defends it. They're, to the point where when there's no movies coming out, they will dig up movies from the past that were considered trash and start going completely <laughs> contrarian about defending them and saying, this was really good, yeah. actually. And none of that. That's and you're happened. like, what the? <laughs> That's happening with the Star Wars prequels right now, where it's yeah. like suddenly, suddenly it's some kind of masterpiece criticism of <laughs> capitalism or something. Like, okay, yeah. well, whatever. And uh, so... And the thing is, is like when you put art up for for judgment, there's always going to be a back and forth about whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether they like it, whether they don't, how to fix it, how how what what to keep, yada, yada, yada. And I think the biggest takeaway for me has always been, what am I trying to say? How am I trying to say it? And I have to ask myself those questions. And it's when I can't answer them that I offer it up to critique. So when I yeah. when I bring a script, I bring it and I'm coming with loaded with questions. I don't usually have them read the script and the table read and then say, okay, what's everybody's thoughts? Because that that's not what I'm looking for. What I'll get to is, did you get that this guy was, was trying to rape her? Like he was trying to get her in a position where she was alone with him? Like I'm asking specific questions to my audience. And then they'll, they'll tell me, yeah, I got that. Or no, I didn't get that. And I'm just – I'm going in as the artist – looking for feedback on specific things and not general approval of my art. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah that so makes the, a take, lot of sense. the takeaway that I'm asking from you is what, how do you go approach critique when you bring something to someone for critique, especially now, cause you don't really do critique with trailer park warlock. I assume you just, you do what you want, you put it out there, but do you evaluate like comment threads after the fact and see if they were picking up that's my critique like, those are those are where i find yeah. my critiques now and um sometimes they're valuable and sometimes they're not as valuable like uh and there are there have been a couple of times where i have read something and gone okay that tells me a lot about whether or not i'm communicating properly what i'm trying to say um and I've definitely done some episodes where I am being willing, willfully like obscure and trying to be confusing for narrative purposes. Mm. And there are times when, I mean, I've gotten critiques where it's like, I don't understand what's going on. And I'm like, well, I guess I'm succeeding in that. <laughs> and what I want to see is I want to see a confirmation of whether or not I have readers go through the process of, not understanding what's going on and then coming to so great example uh season two i have this uh i'd say it's about 10 episodes or so where everything is thrown up in the air and i willingly made this narrative where you don't know like where people are in certain like times and uh like in, in history and everything is made such that you're supposed to piece it together till you get to a point where everything's revealed and suddenly when you look back at all the events that happen they all make sense so that was hard for me to to read the comments for a while because it was people going oh, like this is ridiculous this makes sense i don't understand what you're doing and then finally getting to that that episode where the big revelation happens and seeing the seeing the comments that are like it all suddenly makes sense now. Oh my God, I can't believe what you did. Like, yeah. that's really validating, right? And so it was a really, it's, it, for me, it was challenging to go through that process of critique because I'm like, so long as Just I land this, yeah, yeah, so long as I land this, none of this matters. <laughs> like, I've noticed that when I've done, when I've brought scripts that were incomplete to critique, that's one of the hardest things is bringing an incomplete work for up for critique like i'll bring like the first 20 pages and do you know what i mean something as mundane as um so for the indomitable spirit it's a karate movie about depression that i'm writing and this and that there's a scene early on where the main character is just like dropping food out of his mouth and it falls on the ground and the dog is eating it and his girlfriend is like why do you just let him eat stuff off the floor he's gonna get sick da, 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 da. and by the end of page 20 
everybody's like, you don't need the whole scene with the dog eating the Cheetos off the floor. That's irrelevant. Cut it. Get rid of it. In my mind, I know that's paying off later on down the script. That's a setup for something. It seems mundane and completely, and that's what it's supposed to be doing now. So when you get to a critique and you, it's, it, that's one of the worst things in the world where it's just like, we have to tell your audience, hang on, let me finish. Cause it's yeah, not exactly. done yet. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's one of the worst things in the world, but the absolute worst thing. And I think we were going to do a whole podcast on this and I don't know, maybe we'll talk off the air and see if you think that we'll be able to, but we got 20 minutes left at least here. Um, to me, the most invaluable sometimes, and granted it, it does have value the most invaluable and hard to accept commentary or critique is I like it. It's good. Period. <laughs> Validation. Yeah, when yeah. it's like, oh, I got everything. I understood it. I liked it. Period. It's like there's nothing like that's the worst yeah. critique and the best critique at the same time. Yeah, I'm actually I won't. I Yeah, because I do want to kind of say this for an entire podcast. But I will say sure. that it's really curious because validation is one of those things where if, say, your mom tells you, oh, I really like this. <laughs> this is nice. You're like, Ugh, whatever. Thanks, what some, mom. Yeah. yeah. No, random fucking stranger says it. Suddenly it's imbued with like so much more power to it in a way but, that is but you know what you're gonna say, Jack? but you don't know if they're just being dismissive because they don't give a shit or at least that's sure. the, the stuff that pops in my mind is just like either a they don't know what they're talking about and they just dismiss because they want to talk about something they don't feel comfortable with or they don't care and they're just trying to be nice or in my situation i've had situations where people tell me they like my stuff just because they're trying to cozy up to me and they want me to film their movie or something like that. Oh, so sure. like well, that's that's, yeah, that's, that's another thing where you again, we're still on the line of though judging your critiquer's motives. Yeah. <laughs> that's the yeah. that's the really hard sure. thing. And and the validation is is part of that. You really have to accept whether or not it's pure validation from someone who looks to gain nothing from you. The way I judge that, and I, I don't know if you're the same way, but when someone gives me valid critique, um or like validating critique or positive critique where there's no adjustments or no confusion about anything and they understood the concept. The only way I normally tell if it actually is sincere is when they ask for more. When they oh, say, yeah. are you going to write a for sequel sure. to this? Or, you know, when are you going to shoot this? Yeah. Is this is this getting filmed? Like, I want to see this. Can I get a ticket now? Like, that, that yeah. kind of stuff starts feeding my ego to the point where it's like, and I don't say ego in a bad way. I mean, like, it's like, Oh, I've created something that someone enjoyed and now they want to continually enjoy more of it. And that to me is where the validation comes in. Not just, it was good. I liked it. It's when they go <laughs> further. So when you can critique somebody and you can ask questions to them about like, that's the best way to positive critique. In my opinion is when they, yeah. someone asks you questions almost like a Q and a after a movie, it's like, well, how did you come up with this idea? And you know, uh, what were you thinking when you did this? Where did this originate? Where did like, when they start plundering your mind for how the execution or where the concept came from or whatever it may be, that's yeah. when that validation starts working for me and I can start trusting my reviewer. Yeah. More. That's why I started. Um, that's why I started doing at the end of seasons and trailer park warlock. I'll do like a, I'll do a season wrap up because it serves two functions. One, it's a way first function is it's a way for me and the audience to communicate with each other, to figure out if what I'm doing is still entertaining one, <laughs> uh, but also like um, what questions do you have about what happened over the course of the events of this narrative? And what do you feel like needs to be cleared up for you? Uh, Cause that helps me figure out, okay, where did I fill in the narrative? Right. Mm. Uh, where did I not, where did I not go? Where did I go wrong? And then the other part is I inevitably get questions where, I mean, it's kind of fishing for validation. Let's be honest, but I get, and there's I get nothing wrong with that. Let's yeah. just put that out there. There's nothing I wrong get, with wanting to be validated as an artist. I get questions, you know, I get questions where people are like, okay, well, what are your inspirations? Or like, what are, what are, what are things that you were thinking about when you're writing the story and, and stuff like that? And 
just sort of to mirror what you were saying, like it does, it is really validating to sort of be, to be asked in more depth. And I feel like most artists go through this where they, they're kind of seeking those moments where they're asked more in depth about where their ideas are coming from. And then kind of, because it's an opportunity to open out, uh, open up about maybe what your overall philosophy on things are, is, or like what, um, what are the deeper thoughts that you're having in your head that you haven't figured out how to properly communicate in art at the mm -hmm. moment? That's interesting. Um, I wish I could have that kind of feedback these days where it's like <laughs> people, you know what I mean? Cause when you do, you present stuff on the internet for a critique or whatever. And it, I think the, the most, Sometimes even when someone hates your work can almost be a validating thing because Oh yeah. Oh when you, for sure. <laughs> when you're looking at it, the the, the the most deflating thing as an artist is when your work gets ignored. Yeah. Uh when when no one wants to comment either way, whether they're booing or cheering, it's good. Yeah. But when the crowd goes silent, that's when you're like, damn, I definitely I fucked theory. up. <laughs> I have a theory that you you have nobody has made it as an artist until they have vehemently irrational haters. <laughs> it's not until that point that you know that you're making you're breaking through. Because yeah, you're gonna have people who are gonna love your art, but they might only stick around for a while, you know? I mean the haters only stick around for a while too. But for somebody to go out of their way to hate what you're making requires an extra level of like an extra level of involvement contempt requires an extra level of involvement that love never quite will meet because contempt requires somebody going out of their way to be negative towards somebody else which inevitably hurts them too like holding on to that negativity is like sure. just as toxic for them as it is for the other person that they're lobbing, they're lobbing that toxicity at. Um, but to go out of their way to do it is like, it's a really perverted form of love. Like, yeah. I don't know how else to put it. Yeah. Like, and then like here's the another. Where the, yeah, where the guy it, and the girl hate each other. And then by the end of the movie, they, they fall in love. Yeah. This is actually, and this goes into another question I have for you, because I know I've had this a couple of times. Has there ever been an artist that you admire but on the face you just hate because you're like i can't believe this guy is getting so much attention but deep down you're like god he's so good at what he does um maybe i'm misunderstanding your question but maybe it's just particular to me because i've had artists where i find that i am i'm doing that rom-com thing of like being uh feeling aggro towards them and at the same time being like oh but they're so they're such a good artist like i don't understand <laughs> i have i have one particular filmmaker and i will reveal the name if you want me to you got to ask though i won't just yeah, you're welcome to <laughs> okay um but before i say before i say their name i will say my my relationship with them and this is not a personal relationship clearly this is an audience and artist relationship but every time they tweet something or they're in an interview and they talk about filmmaking and they talk about execution and content and style, everything that they say about film, I'm like, fuck yes, I believe exactly what you say. You are right. That is 100% the way I see it too. I believe what you believe. Da 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 da. But every single one of their movies, I don't see what everyone else sees because everyone else is like oh my god it was amazing and i was like really <laughs> it really wasn't that good and yeah. that filmmaker for me and i'm about to get lynched guillermo del toro oh yeah well i can see that though because i mean i like i like del toro but i can see why you might feel that way because his stuff is very like um what's the word he has a particular style, you know, yeah. like he's kind of like sushi. Like you either like that, you either like it or you don't, you know? Well, there's a, th there's a thing where I'm, I I've noticed in audiences and I'm still in, I'm starting to really get a grasp more on different types of audiences um, where there are people who are simply there for style, just for oh, yeah. the, the, sure. the visual aesthetic and style. And I've noticed that del Toro's visual style, and I'm, I'm not hating on this at all, 
is incredible. It's it's a it's a signature. It's great. It's original. It it's powerful. It's well thought out. It's well executed. The whole nine yards. Yeah. The stories, however, on the other hand, do not speak to me on any level whatsoever. But I've noticed that there are filmmakers or there, there is an audience who simply goes for style, period. Yeah. And then there's another there's another section of, of film audiences that go for story, period. And they could care less about the style here and there. And I'm more of a story guy. But when I hear Gal Del Toro talk, I'm like, yeah, why? Why don't you do what you're talking about? I don't I don't <laughs> see it there. But I've noticed. But I've come to the conclusion he is a he's a visual aesthetic filmmaker and another and but when he gets a good script by somebody he can make a great film but when he does other scripts or whatever or even if he writes them himself I'm, I'm not that well up on it to be honest um they they don't speak to me and the same goes for another filmmaker who is very hot topic right now Zack Snyder I think sure. visually yeah. visually I <laughs> Snyder is incredible I think he's a great a great 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 visual artist I think he can yeah. He can film and everything like that. I think he can probably even direct quite well. But the scripts that he directs are terrible. Yeah, so that right. pulls all the air out of it for me. But that's so that's the, another thing about critique that I'm starting just now in my career as an artist to understand is looking at the audience and understanding that certain audiences are wanting different things or oh, yeah. expecting different things. And that's a big part of understanding their critique. So when someone says, that they loved the last Jedi, Star Wars, they were looking for something to, to somebody to turn the table over when they when yeah. it came into Star Wars. Yeah, they did not want the same thing over again. And then there was another subsection of the audience that was like, no, 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 no. We just want a new version of Empire Strikes Back. We don't want anything that yeah. don't don't get artsy on me. Just this is popcorn Star Wars movie. Give me what I want. And yeah. Then there's another part of me that's like I was in that section where I was like, just give me what I want. I don't I don't want to let's not <laughs> let's not yeah. try things. And then on the other side of that, I hated Rogue One, which was the epitome I'm... of the movie where it's like, here's yeah. everything you want. And yeah. I was like, no, really, too many cookies. We really agree on that. I did not want any of that in Rogue One that <laughs> happened. And then Last Jedi, for me, I was one of those people where it was exactly, it was the demented kind of stuff I exactly wanted in Last Jedi, where I mean, Yoda's burning the <laughs> scrolls of the Jedi, and I don't know what's going to happen now. Like, yeah. I was exactly what I was looking for, but it was clearly not what a lot of other people were looking for, and that's okay, you know? At least I got it once, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but I think as an artist, I think we, that's another part of critique that we need to talk about here in our, as we wrap up. Um is being okay with some people not liking it. I think yeah. as much as we seek validation, I do think we need to um, look at our own art. And this is a, the kind of the topic to wrap us up, which is self-critique. Um, yeah. When we look at our own work, and, we, we, and we've touched on this in the past with about when to end a project, but at some point you do need to look at your own art and say, this is really good. I did awesome here. I'm proud of myself. And other times when you got to look at it and you go, I don't like that way I put that line. I gotta erase that. I gotta fix that. I gotta yeah. I gotta fix that. And self critique, I think, is one of the best things that an art uh, an artist can have. And again, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier in the podcast with the internet and people immediately putting up the shield when there's critique thrown at them about their work. Which is, I think, you do need to be receptive and especially to yourself. You need to go at yourself hard. Yeah. And that's when your best work comes out is when you're honest with yourself. It's like, yeah. yeah, I didn't do that as good. And I had an off day or my, my mind was somewhere else. That I think is the biggest takeaway for critique is, is being humble enough to know that when you're wrong and being egotistical enough to know when you're awesome. Yeah. And I think that's actually like, um, I would say that's the whole purpose of the process of critique is so that you as a, as an individual, can catch your catch your mistakes before anybody else so you just don't make them or you don't make yeah. them as as immediately uh it's a it's about a process of improving and so that you further and further refine your craft to the point that you can get to that um you can get into that holy state of just flow i mean you may never reach it right but that's no. what you aim yeah. for that's the ideal is you aim for a place where you're just like 
I know exactly what I need to do in this moment. I need. I know what I need to make and have happen in order to communicate what is going on in my mind and know with certainty that the other person on the other end is going to hear it and feel it. What you just said there, I think, is the complete purpose of uh, of critique. And I think this yeah. is what our audience needs to take away is even bad critique. When you go in, if you present something in front of a, a, a critique group or an audience or whatever it may be, and the entire thing is ill received it's bad like you didn't do anything you wanted to you as an artist need to and i'm not trying to be mr positive with the insincerity here but you need to walk out of that room thinking this was great because the point of critique is to remove uncertainty in either direction did i do this good or did i fail knowing that is how knowing whether you failed or succeeded is how you move forward as an artist yeah. with whether the project or the next project or you as a person. That's what the point of critique is removing the doubt or the unknown factor of did I do it? And I really like what you're saying there because that's, that's actually the thing that really stops a lot of uh, creative people from creating is the uncertainty. And they yeah. want to, they want to be able to feel certain that what they're going, the next steps they're going to take are going to actually lead, even if it's not going to lead to financial success, it's going to lead to, I have successfully done the thing I intended to in my mind. Yeah. And uh, that's why it's so important to be able to be able to receive what other people are saying so that over time, you just, you don't have to hear the other people as often, not that you should close them off or anything, but yeah. just to be in that place of confidence and self-esteem to go you know regardless of what regardless of what everybody thinks i know that i did this to the best of my ability and that's yes. as an artist that's where you want to be right is you want to know that you did everything you could to communicate your idea and and we've talked about this before we'll talk about it again I, I still to this day do not think that failure is the bad thing i think failure yeah. is a necessary step towards success and when you go to critique and you get a failure, you know what I mean? You can't look at that as the end. It's got to be a, a step. It may be a step back, but maybe, you know, when you're getting shot at, stepping back is not a bad thing. Yeah. So <laughs> when you're failing, stepping back is not a bad thing. You got to step back to step forward right way and exactly. get to where you're trying to go. So when you go into critique and you get massacred, come out of it thinking, good, everything I know or everything I did wasn't working but at least now i know that and i'm not going to waste time continuing that journey i'm you know what i mean like i'm going yeah. to, i can go down the other path now and now it'll work or you just finish your piece you put it in the closet or in a drawer and you say you know what maybe in 20 years somebody will get this <laughs> but today is not the day and and that's very true too uh you you have to look at Sometimes the cheese does stand alone and sometimes the <laughs> artist is the cheese yeah. and you just have to accept that maybe, maybe the world doesn't see it the way you do, but eventually someone will open that drawer, whether it's your great, great grandkid or someone who buys the house after you die or whatever, opens it and looks at it and goes, wow, this is really awesome. And, and you know what I mean? Like if you can get to a piece, an inner peace with that, then that's fine. But for yeah, the most sure. part, when you go to critique, it's just removing doubt from your mind, whether you're succeeding or losing at the current point in the zeitgeist, I guess is the word, maybe. I don't know if yeah, that's, that's the right a good word. word. That's a good word. Yeah, I know it's a fancy word. I'm using fancy words just like people <laughs> do in critique. Um, in the last minute or two, I just want to I want to fire some shots um, okay. about the again, judging your critiquers. Uh, there are people who are there for purely selfish reasons for themselves uh it's kind of like when you watch an art film and the pretentious people talk about all the things that they loved about it and you're like i don't know how the hell you saw that in this yeah. uh you're just using words to sound like you're artsy and you know about stuff like I'm, I'm sure there are people who do see deep things in stuff that i don't understand and that's you know that's the way the world works with experiences and art and how people view yeah. things differently but there are also people who are going to blow you up or tear you down 
to make themselves look better. And those are the kinds of critiquers that you just need to cut them out. Cut them out for sure. You just got to completely turn your brain off and think about Looney Tunes cartoons yeah. when they're talking. And Once just, you figure uh, it out, because it's sometimes it's not as obvious. And then sure. there comes a point where you, where you put it together and it's like, you just got to, you know, just don't even give them the attention anymore. You know, well, the way I look at power from. Yeah. And the way I look at it, every time someone gives me a critique, I will think about this question alone. How do I apply this? What they just talked about? Is it like, oh, the, the depth is really retrospective here and it invokes tones of lavender in my brain. It's like, OK, I don't know what that means and I don't know how to apply that to yep. my work going forward. I don't know how you're getting lavender scents in your brain because I used purple. Like, you know, like Yeah, it's something like, like if I if I ever receive something like that, I'd just be like, okay, thanks. <laughs> That's yeah, it. Yeah, like sure. move on. <laughs> yeah. Always be polite. And uh, I guess oh, that's something I wanted to talk about too. We're running out of time. Damn it. Um not giving so Christopher Nolan, not that we don't talk about him enough on this podcast. <laughs> Christopher Nolan is almost infamous for not weighing in on his movies. Um, so, like, there's the question about, like, Inception about, you know, was it all a dream? Was it not a dream? Was he was the, the whole wedding ring on his hand when he was dreaming or not dreaming or whatever? And Nolan does not weigh in on his two cents about what he was trying to do. So when your audience is confused or doesn't know, do you say, what's the value to you, Mr. Rainwater, about not weighing in as the artist when your art is getting critiqued is there value in that or is it a disservice to your audience to not ex to not lay out when you present a finished piece and you don't weigh in on it as the artist is that good or bad i think it's important not to initially weigh in until there's been enough feedback given you know like i think because it's like um you could pervert the feedback you could yes paint it. exactly exactly because something that i think about going back to art school days is you know people give critique and then a lot of times artists will give a defense right and saying like oh well i was trying to say this i was trying to say this i was trying yeah. to do that that's not the point at all that the point is not for you to try and communicate what you're trying to do, the art was supposed to do that. And this is where you hear now like whether or not it, it happened. And you take your notes and like, you know, if you're on the level of somebody, if you're at a certain level, right? Like you were doing like Christopher Nolan level or you're doing level where you've got layers upon layers in a narrative. At that point, you're like, I mean, for me, I know like at that point, it's like, I'm finding out how many layers people were reading into the story. If they don't get to like layer three, that's fine. I'm looking for somebody who got into <laughs> layer three because they're the person that I want to pay attention to in terms yeah. of what other critiques are they going to give in the future? Like what other feedback they're going to have because that person's really reading deeply. Because, I mean, great artists want to see great audience audiences too. You know what I mean? Like not yep. to be, I mean, it's sort of a hubristic thing to say, but um, I think in a lot of ways, artists are looking, I, I, this is a phrase I really like, which is that um, find the others. And so an artist is always somebody who's trying to find the others, the people who are like them are like-minded because those are, that's how you sort of start, you get into the next level of artistry, which is forming relationships and in forming relationships, making opening up opportunities to make your art better uh, and to make other people's art better. And in because in that exchange and in that interchange, there's opportunity for a lot of growth. And as artists, we're always seeking. I mean, anybody, any artist who's worth their weight in salt or whatever is is seeking, you know, that kind of relationship are that kind of potential for growth to get to levels they never even thought were possible in the, in the past. So yeah. Um, yeah, just to sort of reiterate what you're saying, like I do think it's important for <laughs> the artists to submit their work, shut the hell up. And then if they have something to say, say it much later on. Uh, if they have something that they feel like they need to defend. Cause every once in a while there might be something that like, you know, Oh, I feel like, 
I need to defend this one thing because y'all just are not yeah. picking this particularity yeah. up. You overestimated the intelligence of your audience. There's a lot yeah. of people who always say, don't assume your audience is stupid. But then on the flip side of that, there is a time when you overestimate how much that they're paying attention to. Because I've yeah. noticed um, sometimes in my own work, I've I've been waiting for someone, like you said, to pick up on things that I've drizzled in. And sometimes I've done it so subtly that no one's caught it. And I'm just like, you guys didn't notice that this happens? It's like right there. It's black and white. It literally says he kills her. Like, no yeah. one caught that. It literally so, says it. <laughs> that whole thing that I was talking about with the layers, too, is I think that that was the kind of film that Christopher Nolan was making when he made Tenet, is he was trying to find the people who picked it up and got it. And for me, I'm just like, I watched the movie. And I'm like, uh, I don't know. But <laughs> I'm... I think there's some people that he's looking for who are going to write to him and be like, oh my God, this scene where whatever happened, like I totally understood what you were doing and saying, like that's just what he's looking for. I'm not the person he was looking for when he made that movie, but that's okay. You know? I mean, I, to, to his credit on that thing, and we're going over time here, um, he did make a movie that is required rewatching to understand yeah. in a culture where people go see Avengers 12 times because who the fuck knows? Like, they just enjoyed it that much that they'll go to the movies 12 times and watch it over and over and over. So he made a movie that you could go see 12 times to try to figure out what's going on. And I applaud that. Like, I think that there's nothing wrong with approaching that mindset, but I think there's something missing in that initial viewing, that core primal drive-through through line that attracts people to come back i don't think that the puzzling factor is really the the draw for the return yeah. um and i think that's what he was going for so i think it was a misstep in that sense but i think over time not from me because I, I, I don't feel like hurting my brain but over time that <laughs> film that film's gonna find an audience and that oh, audience sure. will build because the more it gets deconstructed and the more people, you know, like pull a toe for grace and they re-edit it themselves so that it plays the yeah. right way and this and that. And they start playing. That's going to be it. the most video essayed movie in the next <laughs> yeah. like years. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, no doubt about it in my mind. But anyway, so we're wrapping up now. Let's just uh, we're going to do our bullet points, which is our new thing. Um, Mr. Rainwater did it on our last podcast and I absolutely right. love it. And I feel it's a good takeaway for you guys. That was our self critique of the last podcast. I really loved what we did where we bullet pointed all the things we discussed so that you as an artist or maybe someone who's flirting with the idea of becoming an artist, uh, can just have the takeaways laid out for them. So we talk, Oh Jesus, we probably take notes from now on when we do this because already I'm forgetting the things that we pointed out. Um, make sure that well, we you, talked you about, oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. You go ahead. You go ahead. Uh, we talked about, uh, well, we started off talking about the anxiety about feedback and critique, That's right. right? Because it's, it's very hard to put your work in front of other people and not know what they're going to think about it. Um, criti Just you do know, it. Cr yes. The process of art is one of communicating your mind and hoping that there's somebody out there who is going to enjoy what you're about to say. Um, and then next, uh, I don't know. Jow, can, we talked, can you help we me out about, here? Uh, we talked about the first time um, that both of us felt like we gave valid critique that helped the artist, which I think is a very important thing that you as an artist need to contribute to your fellow artists, which is not necessarily impressing your style. I didn't say this before, but I'm saying it now. Don't impress your style or your what you're trying to say um, during a critique. Usually when I, when I go for a critique... I will ask the artist what their intent was, um, and then I will lay out for them whether or not I felt they accomplished that for me. Um, and I feel like when you are critiquing a fellow artist, you need to abandon your team and join their team, see what the goal was, and try to help them get to their goal as opposed to perverting their work as to what you would do or how you would do it or what you would think would work. It's more about helping the artist. So ask questions when you're doing a critique. When you're positively critiquing someone, help them. Be on their team. Be on their side. Yeah, and um, if you can do so, you're 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 in the position of also building great relationships for later on. Yeah. 
Uh, then next up, we talked about judging your actual audience, and I think that's where we kind of got into a major uh, a portion of the podcast, which was evaluating the people critiquing. You need to understand whether or not they do see things the way uh, you uh, you do, or they understand what your goals are, and this and that, and applying what they say to positively improve your work uh, or your skill set, whichever it may be. Um, so you as an artist need to kind of understand who it is that's talking and kind of get, and this is important for an artist when they're approaching a piece too, is like you do have a directive of something you're trying to say under, and, and why you're trying to say it. You know why you're telling this story. Like it speaks to you for a reason. So when you hear someone critique you, you need to ask yourself, you need to deduce their motives as to why why are they telling me to do that? Is it because they want to help me or is it because they want to see something explode. Uh, you know what I mean? Like it's yeah. one of those things that you have to ask yourself, is that really what I'm trying to do? So you don't lose your voice um, in terms of your, your work. It doesn't become uh, art by committee, um, which is a terrible thing. Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. That's what you want to <laughs> avoid at all costs. And then I think lastly, we were talking about self critique and yeah. uh, validation and stuff like that, which self critique was... is the ultimate purpose of the whole process to begin with. To be yeah. to be totally actualized, self actualized in your ability as an artist, but to get there, you have to find um, find those perspectives around you that are useful, so that you can get out of the uncertainty of whether or not you're doing the job well or not. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole point of critique. That's what we'll, we'll end on. To, to understand that when you go to critique, it's not to inflate your ego and it's not to crush your soul. The point is to walk in present a somewhat completed piece of work in front of other people, whether they're artists or not, doesn't matter. Sometimes it matters, but most of the time it doesn't. And to remove the unknown from your brain. Am I communicating? Are they understanding my language or are they not? And yeah. that's, that's the goal of critique. When you walk in, Did, remove that doubt from your brain. So don't ever take the, the, you failed, uh, critique the soul gripping it's hard i know i know guys but don't take that as a loss you got to walk out of there thinking all right i drove i took the wrong exit i got to get back on the highway and i got to turn the car around and go a couple more yeah. exits or, or something like that and that's the positive takeaway you will save yourself time and money and anguish once you've done the critique so i implore you guys to keep open-minded uh, when you get critique, you really got to be careful on the internet. It's really hard because everybody is just – when people go on the internet, it's mostly because they're discontent with something and they just want to rip it apart because it makes them – it's like a it's like a drug, a temporary hit to make them feel better uh, <laughs> by shitting on someone else because misery loves company. But, yeah. but there are communities. I do believe there are communities where people are genuinely there to help because they want to inspire. Um in future podcasts, I am hoping after we get, uh, because we've talked about this and we're kind of wrapping up now, but we are going to have guests on intermittently after episode 10 of Midnight at the Spaghetti Factory. And at some point in the future, I am hoping that we can do a critique podcast where Ooh. me, Rainwater, and maybe two or three of our guests We'll all submit pieces, and you'll be able to see them in the YouTube video. Um, and then you guys can watch us give critique to each other uh, and see how that goes. Um, it could be a total shit show, and we might burn bridges <laughs> with some of our friends. Um, or it might be really beneficial. I don't know, but I think it would be a good experiment. And I think that's I one like of the this idea about. a lot. Yeah. But uh, but for now, we're going to wrap up and uh, we'll say goodnight to you guys and we will be back next week. Take care, everybody. Yeah. Take care. Good night.